I'm Vinny Politi, and thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And wow, things heating up inside a courtroom in DeKalb County, Georgia, not too far away from Court TV. By the way, um, it's involving some social media issues uh, to begin with. Now, you know me. Uh, maybe you follow me on social media. I have nothing against it. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm very prolific on social media. If you go to my Facebook page or my brand new YouTube page, you can find a lot of great content there, folks. Um, and I believe anyone should be permitted to do social media. But there's like, there's like a time and a place for it, okay? Like for me, I'm not going to do it during the show here, right, when I'm live. No, because I'm doing my job right now. And... I don't know, if I was a criminal defendant on trial for rape and was behind bars being detained, I don't know if I'd go live on Instagram. But this defendant did. So, so yeah, y'all. The judge caught COVID. The judge caught COVID. She got, she tested positive for COVID. They don't want you to know that. They're trying to hide that. The judge tests positive for COVID. Out of all the cheating they did in this case, the judge tests positive for COVID. They don't say that on the news. They just trying to protect her in some kind of way to let so she won't be shown to, to have tested positive for COVID. Out of nowhere, she can she, she cheat all you want with this man law, but at the end of the day, there's a laws of the universe. See, you're being corrupt, and it's the laws of the universe, and this is what happens. She tests positive for COVID. I tell my lawyer, this is when I know I'm getting railroaded, because I'm telling my lawyer, I'm saying, like, I don't want to go in there with her with COVID. They're already cheating on me. They're cheating in the case as it is. I don't want to go in there right now. Yeah, that was after court. <laughs> From behind bars. Live on Instagram. And... You know, we can debate the, the validity of the point he's trying to make, which could be very important, uh, depending upon, you know, your perspective on, on all those things related to COVID and who has it, who doesn't have it, what should be done. But still, like, you're going live during your trial where you're facing a lot of time in prison, and you're talking about the judge. Now, who are we talking about here? His name is Eligio Bishop, and... He, he, some call him a cult leader. That's sort of the accusation. You know, you can make your own judgment on that. But he's got a bunch of people who follow him. Some men, few more, I think, are women. Um, and he's got this organization. They're, they're the women. Uh, and there's rules, et cetera. A lot of the rules involve him uh, engaging in sexual acts with the women. But most Cult leaders do that. I don't know if he is a cult leader, but uh, I, I've seen that in my, in my career. The most cult leaders sort of set up the cult so they can have uh, sex with women. But anyhow, he's on trial, though, facing sexual assault rape charges. Very, very serious charges. Um, he's been in court. There he is. He has the mask on. He's concerned about COVID. Um, no problem with that. Uh, but today... He didn't even go into the courtroom. He, he ended up from a jailhouse courtroom. Take a look, like remote, not in the courtroom for his own trial. He had to appear remote. And, and it's all because of his concern about COVID in the courtroom. You heard him on Instagram Live. Now let's go inside the courtroom to listen to um, his attorney and the judge going back and forth about this issue. I don't know that the court can put him in a position where it's, it's his health and his concern. He's wearing a mask and it is a distance from the court. But we are all in the same courtroom. We're all breathing the same air. And so his concern is that a his witness or one of his witnesses is unwilling to be able to come here to court to testify in the courtroom with COVID. And that he's being compelled to go forward with a trial uh, where he's entitled to be present physically in court. Um, and be in a courtroom where a person is test positive for COVID obviously the most vital person, which is he. And so uh, his position is that he's asking the court not to proceed until the court has tested it negative or gone outside of the CDC guidelines. Wearing a mask, I'm happy to wear a mask for the duration of the trial. Jurors are ready to go forward. Jurors are ready to go forward. Nobody 
they think bullying has gotten sick. <laughs> um, if, you know, I was contagious on Monday when I didn't know I had it. So nobody's gotten it um, since then. I've been in close contact with my staff, a whole closer contact with them than I am with you all. Luckily, none of them have it. We have an air purifier system going on, a machine going on in the courtroom. We're taking every possible precaution to keep people safe, including providing masks, um, allowing anybody who wants to wear a mask to wear one, um, hand sanitizer, all of that. Hey, Mr. Bishop, I know you're, you're doing everything you possibly can to try to get this case to go away, or at least get away from me. Um, but that's not how it works. So, okay, we, um, We've got the feed going. So we Mr. Smith indicated that he did not make that statement on the jail hall. So I want to make sure. Okay. All right. There wasn't, it's interesting how he was able to post an Instagram live post from the jail, but somebody emailed my office that there was some post. I, I would mean, go, yeah, don't talk about it, Mr. Bishop. It's not going to help you. So after losing the arguments to have the case postponed because of the COVID issue, that defendant stayed in the jail, felt like he was safer in the jail uh, and, and, and appeared from there. And, and there he is. And th I mean, it's this strange world, right? Think about where we were a few years ago. Like, even if people didn't have COVID, we didn't even have, we didn't even have trials. Uh, and now... We've got a trial and someone apparently has COVID in the courtroom and apparently it's the judge and everything's continuing. Now, it did continue and there were some more important witnesses who took the stand for the defense. Member followers, I was gonna say members of the cult, but uh, that's a, the jury can decide what they think about this organization. Uh, but followers of this defendant uh, took the stand in his defense. Take a look. Did Mr. Bishop have different characters that he would, he would do for production? Yes, he did. Can you tell us some of the characters he would do? Uh, Mr. Bishop, uh, Dr. Bishop, it was uh, like a psychologist character that he would play to help help some of the members go through anything that they were going through. Uh, he had Uncle Fernando. What was Uncle Fernando? It was just like a, a, a comedian. Okay. He just, you know. Okay. Uh, anyone else that you saw him? Uh, three guys. Okay, what was that? Uh, well, that was just a character. Um, the, if you look at the spiritual meaning of three, it's the perfect number. It means knowledge, wisdom, being in harmony with the universe. So that was a character that he played, and we all agreed to push that character for the, to the public. Has you ever witnessed any acts of violence between Mr. Bishop uh, and women in the group? No, sir. Have you ever seen him punch or hit or kick somebody? No, sir. Uh, how about uh, surround them and body slam them or anything like that? No, sir. Has you ever seen uh, him commit any physical acts of violence against? No, sir. Has you ever seen her with any uh, bruises or anything like that that Mr. Bishop would have uh, placed on her? No, sir. Um, what about women? Did, did you see or hear Mr. Bishop direct women uh, to hit other women on his back? Not that I've seen, sir. So everything wrapped up today in terms of evidence and arguments and tomorrow on Verdict Friday, uh, the jury will begin their deliberations. Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy. Also with us in Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias. And someday, again, I'm, I'm, maybe next week, I'm just not going to mention her name. Kirk Nurmi is with us. And in Los Angeles, California, president of the West Coast Trial Lawyers and former federal prosecutor, Nima Romani. All right, Eklund, you're in Georgia. You're in courtrooms yeah. in Georgia. What would yeah. Eklund do if you're in that situation? Oh, there's no trial because the issue is, is that we were there. Um, hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives. And when we, um, the, the difference is we have COVID protocols um, to prevent the spread of COVID. And one, one of the protocols were like negative tests. Before we could even open things, we needed neg negative tests. So the idea that although preventative measures um, were done afterwards, he as a defendant, um, on a trial for his life has 
absolutely the right to ask for a postponement because you don't know his story. We don't know, um, we know, we don't know how COVID can affect him. We don't know if he has a respiratory issue. We don't know he visited, if he visits people in jail. There's so many, um, there's so many uh, things that we're not considering. And I think that it should have been for the purposes of judicial economy, because I think that he has a very good appealable issue that court should have stopped. Kirk Nurmi, he, he felt safer in jail than inside the courtroom. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think obviously, as the judge pointed out, this man is doing everything he can to delay the trial and or get a new judge on the trial. That's obvious. But I think in his zeal to do that, as Eklund kind of touched on, he might have pointed out a, a, a really important issue. He might have highlighted something that could get his case overturned because I cannot think of, and this is going to be an issue, I think, of first impression, right? When is a defendant's health and safety and possible life being put in jeopardy by the judge that's presiding over his case, right? So his choice is possibly put my, himself in jeopardy and or not attend his trial. And in that regard, I think Eklund is spot on. The judge should either delay the trial until she's test negative, what have you, because she's putting all the health of all these people at risk. And I know if I was the defense attorney, I certainly wouldn't want to be there under those circumstances. I don't know that if counsel has voiced that or not, but yeah, in his zeal, he's stumbled across what I think might be a legitimate issue. Nima Romani, this is a defendant who has shocked me twice today. First, um, you know, the Instagram live from behind bars. Second, he didn't testify. Well, Vinny, you know, Instagram Live, TikTok Live, you know, I'm a big fan, but not for criminal defendants when you're on mm -hmm. trial. And, you know, I would have expected this defendant to testify because he's taken every opportunity to tell his story on social media and elsewhere. Maybe he finally listened to his lawyers and he's gone through many of them. You know, and echoing what Eklund and Kirk said, you know, if you're the judge here, and I know the CDC guidelines have changed a little bit from five days to 24 hours, but you really want to make sure that these cases are bulletproof on appeal. Sometimes judges just want to move forward, especially when they're frustrated with the pace of a case. They don't want to waste the jurors' time. But, you know, putting this case on hold for, you know, a day or two, even pushing it out to next week, I think would have avoided an unnecessary appellate issue down the road. Now, for an appellate issue to occur, Eklund Mercy, they need to convict him. This is a, yeah. a fascinating case. Like, there's an accusation of, of the revenge porn, but the most serious is the sexual assault rape here. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and I'm wondering, you know, you're, you're talking about members of this following, this carbon nation. What, what will it take for this jury to be convinced that this was a sexual assault versus someone who was in this polyamorous thing and was a little bit upset about the way things went. I don't know. It, it, it just seems like it's not your classic sexual assault case or sexual assault accuser. I honestly don't think it matters. I think um, he wins it procedurally. The fact that there was a positive um, COVID test negates all of that. I think that he has um, the um, the defense rights itself. The fact that he also showed damage and that he didn't testify on his own behalf because it's either testify and um, be subject to COVID or, you know, be in the jailhouse and test and risk testifying via television. So I think that his rights were so infringed that it doesn't matter the facts at this point. Kirk Nurmi, your thoughts. Do you think this is an easy one for the jury considering the relationships and the circumstances surrounding the accuser and the defendant? I think it is going to be easier for the state than I originally thought about it because you think about the revenge porn aspect of this case, right? The idea that this woman left after this sexual encounter and he publishes this stuff. That shows a level of control. We've heard from other members of this carbon nation about how they weren't supposed to eat till Mr. Bishop ate, how he was kind of in control of everything. So that control element is going to be very key. And I think to some extent, the revenge porn charges kind of 
illustrate that for the jury because you're right. It's not the traditional kind of sexual assault. But when we talk about control, when you talk about him having control of finances and everything else and all these rules, I think that level of control will be demonstrated to the jury. And I think they'll be able to get the sex assault convictions as well. Neiman, do you think the jury is going to see him as a cult leader? Oh, potentially, yes, Vinny. And, you know, with these sexual assault cases, like you said, it's really tough to predict what will happen. I mean, we've seen juries hang Bill Cosby the first time, Danny Masterson, right? So, you know, we come here on Court TV, you know, I like to make predictions, but you're right. I mean, on one hand, the argument is, well, the sexual contact didn't happen, but that's not the case. It's, was it consensual, right? And is this someone that regretted it? So I don't think jurors are going to like someone they perceive to be a cult leader. I don't think they're going to like someone that, you know, releases explicit pictures and videos and revenge porn after they have sexual contact with someone. That's going to make the defendant not likable. Is that enough to get a conviction? I don't know, many, but this isn't a very likable defendant, in my opinion. Yeah, that makes a big difference. It absolutely does, how they, how they feel about the defendant. All right, good news. Eklund Mercy, Kirk Nermi, Nima Romani with us the whole hour.